All right, here's a review, uh, video review for your chapter 14 test. And there's some tips here to the right. The number one thing you want to do is make sure you know your identities, okay? Whether or not your teacher gives these to you, you're going to need to know these for your future math classes if you plan on taking math at, at any point in the future. So you might as well just memorize them, uh, get them in your head in some form or another. So the first type are the reciprocal identities, and these are probably your easiest to remember because... Um, you work with the reciprocal functions kind of a lot. So, for instance, like the sine of, a, of some angle theta equals 1 over the cosecant theta. Okay? The cos of some angle equals 1 over the secant. And the tan equals 1 over the cotan. Uh, and this works the opposite direction, too, meaning if I had the cosecant, I can make that equal 1 over the sine. So, if I had cosecant of theta, that also equals 1 over sine theta. And then same for secant theta, equaling 1 over cos theta. And then same thing for cotan theta, equaling 1 over tan. So those are easy ones to remember because they, they go together. The tangent, cotangent come up kind of a lot. And these ones are basically how you can change tan to involve sine and cosine. So the tan of theta equals sine theta over cos theta. Okay. And then the cotan theta is the reciprocal of that. So the reciprocal of sine over cos would be cos over sine. Okay. And this works for tan squared, um, cotan squared. A lot of people think like you, if you see tan squared, sine squared, cos squared, anything squared, it's got to be a Pythagorean identity. So you still have to watch out for your reciprocal and tangent, cotangent identities when you have a squared because th those work the same. What I mean by that is if I had like tan squared theta, that would equal sine squared theta over cos squared theta. Okay, so just because it's squared doesn't mean that this, this identity goes out the window. So uh, the last one is your Pythagorean identities. So the first one, the, most easy, the easiest one to remember is sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. And everything else is based off of this. Basically, if you divide everything out by sine, you get 1 plus cotan squared theta equals cosecant squared theta. And if I divide sine squared plus cos squared equals 1 divided by cosine, I get tan squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta. So if you just remember this one, you're going to remember all the other ones. So those are your identities. You got you to know those. You just kind of went through those real quick. You probably had a sheet on those, so you maybe could have skipped that part if you, if you just wanted to make sure you knew those things. But let's look at a couple questions from here. So these are the matching Let's pull this to the front first. So this is a matching thing, um, but really you need to solve these in order to figure it out. So the first line is a little bit easier than the second. I'm just looking at the first line, um, if I look at cosine times 1 over secant, um, this one is a good one to look at because I think a lot of students get confused by this. But if you use those reciprocal identities like we just said, I see that 1 over secant can just be another cosine. And I know you're like, well, why, why would I do that? Well, when you do that, you get cos squared x, which is actually one of the choices in this case, uh, letter B. So just change things around based off of what you know. So I mean, pr practice, play with these. Um, as far as my tips for these go, these, these are kind of tricky. There's a lot of different things you got to consider. So try a few things. Uh, looking at the next page, I'll look at number six. Six is kind of a tricky one. Uh, when you're dealing with fractions, a common um, error that students make is they don't know how to divide fractions. They don't know how to divide two fractions. So when I change these, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change tan to be sine over cos. And I'm going to change secant to be 1 over cos. And here's where a lot of students get, get tripped up because a lot of students don't know how to divide fractions. Well, dividing fractions, if you remember back to chapter 8, is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So if I divide sine over cos by 1 over cos, it's exactly like taking sine over cos times cos over 1. So you see how that nothing, I mean, it's, it's exactly the same as rational expressions, okay? It's just, you know, the form looks a little different because you've got the sine, sine over cos over 1 over cos. At this point, though, it's just like chapter 8 where you cancel out stuff. In this case, you end up with just sine x, which if I look at my choices, is choice A. So the answer to number 6 is choice A. Just little tips like that. And it's just little things like that, little things to try to make sure that you guys um, are not messing little, little mistakes up like dividing and 
multiplying fractions, things like that. Uh, looking at number seven, for instance, you can just go through that quickly. Cosecant and tan. So I'm looking at cosecant and tan. And I'm like, how do those relate? Well, tan can be sine over cos. Cosecant can be one over sine. If I change both of those to those things, you can see what's going to happen. In this case, the sines cancel. Cancel party there. You get one over the cos. And one over the cos is the same as the secant. So now I pick the choice with secant. And they can see it right there. It's B. So as far as like, how did you know to do that? What did you you got to think about where what's going to happen when you change whatever expression you want um, to using the identities that you have. So as far as this this stuff goes is concerned, you have to make sure you think about the end result. You can't just like blindly change stuff and expect it to end where you want it to end. So you got to think about where you're going. All right, the next page of your chapter 14 review involves uh, some graphing problems. Uh, sine and cos graphs are, they basically behave, this, behave the same. Sine graphs start at 0, 0. So if I'm thinking about like sine x, I'm just thinking about where it starts. Starts at 0, 0. Kind of one, one period of a sine graph looks like that. Cos graph, one period of a cos graph starts up. Kind of looks like that. So it depends, depending on where the graph starts, that's going to be how you kind of determine where, whether it's sine or cosine. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what, is what does each part of the equation mean? Because that's going to be how you're going to be able to do these problems. So for typical y equals a sine bx plus d or something like that, a, the absolute value of a is what's called the amplitude. All right, and the amplitude is just the wave, the height of the wavelength, the distance from the from, um, from the middle line to the top. Okay, so basically two times the amplitude would be the entire like height of the of the full wavelength, and we can show, we talk about that in a second. B is where you get the period. So typically, if there's nothing in front of x, it's just going to be two pi over one. So your typical period is two pi over one, which is just two pi. But if you have a b value, a number in front of x then your period changes to now 2 pi over b. And then d is your vertical shift. Okay, so sometimes a wave will shift up and down. And in this case, d is what changes that. So looking at this particular sheet here, I'm going to look at some of these problems. Okay, so the first bunch, 9 through 13, basically just says find the amplitude and period. Okay, so we could talk about a couple of these, but basically it's just determining from a graph and determining from an equation what the amplitude and period is. Number 11 is kind of tricky because it's got an x over 4 and a lot of times students see that and they, they kind of freak out but really x over 4 is the same thing as 1 fourth x. So if I rewrite that as 1 half sine 1 fourth x minus 3 then I know that the period is 2 pi divided by a fourth. So I could pull out my calculator 2 pi divided by a fourth is 8 pi. Okay, so my period here is 8 pi, and I knew that because x over 4 is the same as 1 fourth x. The amplitude is very simple. The amplitude is the absolute value of the number out in front. So if that number is negative, the amplitude is still positive. Okay, so that would be how you do number 11. The other ones, if I could look at number 13 for a second, amplitude and period from a graph, that's a little more difficult. The amplitude is not too, not too hard. You just kind of count how high up it goes. So in this case, it looks like the amplitude is a half because you can kind of see that this graph kind of goes back and forth between negative a half and a half, which would indicate that the amplitude was about a half. So that's not too hard. The hard part is to determine the period. In this case, this is essentially one full wavelength. And it's one full wavelength that goes from negative 2 pi to 2 pi. And we don't typically look at graphs like this. So this is one wavelength. So one wave that is actually 4 pi long. Okay, It starts at negative 2 pi and ends at 2 pi, which would make it a length of 4 pi. So if you're trying to determine the period, graphically it's the wavelength. Algebraically it's 2 pi over b. So that's how you would do that one graphically. It's a little tricky, but nothing too crazy. Uh, and the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about how to graph. What do we do? Okay, So when I look at an equation, there's a few things that I look for. Okay, So for... Number 15 we'll look at because it's got a vertical shift and I think that's going to help us. Okay, I think about, first I think about the amplitude. And the amplitude again is given by the number that's out in front of 
the cosine. In this case, there's nothing out in front, so that would indicate an amplitude of 1. So therefore, my amplitude is simply 1. Okay? Normally, the max and min, if the amplitude were 1, would be 1 and negative 1. So that's based off of the amplitude. However, there's a vertical shift up 1. Okay? So since I go up 1 from my max and min, I shift both of those values up 1 as well. So I would say this one is going to be 1 plus 1 for my max, and my min is going to be negative 1 plus 1. So that makes my max 2 and my min 0. Okay? So the period is 2 pi over b. So in this case, there is a b value. b is the number in front of x. So in this case, it's 2 pi over 2. So my period in this case is pi. So this is, this is how you figure out the table. And this is the big thing I want you to make sure you know how to do. Because if you can get that, you can get the rest of it. From here, um, we could talk about, I talk about the graph and then I fill in the table. Some teachers might want you to fill in the table and then fill in the graph. Um, but from here, I have to consider a couple things. My First of all, this thing has a vertical shift. So what I do with that is I make this line equal to that vertical shift. So since this vertical shift is positive 1, I'm going to make that line 1. And then everything will be relative to that line. So now this is 0, this is negative 1, this is 2, this is 3, and you kind of go from there. Okay. The next thing I have to determine is my x scale. And your x scale is determined by taking the period over 4. Okay, because there are typically, oops, because there are typically four points to a sine or cos graph. And in this case, so again, the x scale equals the period divided by 4. So for our particular purposes, it would be pi over 4. So there's going to be four main points. So I'm going to graph four points. One, two, three, four. And each one is going to be pi over 4 from the next. So this one's going to be pi over 4. This one's going to be 2 pi over 4, but 2 pi over 4, we know that's pi over 2, so I can even just rewrite that right now so it's perfect. So that's going to be pi over 2. You got 3 pi over 4, and then 4 pi over 4. But I know 4 pi over 4 is simply pi, and that's your check. If you did that right, that last number should be your full period, okay? Setting up the graph is huge. Okay, so let me just write that. The setup is huge. Okay, that's going to be where a lot of your points are rewarded for, for this particular graph. So now I think, about, I think about what kind of graph it is and whether it's positive or negative. So since it's a Coase graph, it's got an amplitude of 1. It's, it's going to start up at the max. And again, I already found the max. So I'm thinking about max and min. The max is 2. The min is zero, so I'm going to go max, zero, min, zero, max, and I plot five points, okay, be careful, you have to have five points, so watch this video a few times, however you want to make sure you know how to graph it, but that's how I go, so now at this point, I've determined the x scale, I've determined where the points are, so I'm just going to fill in my table at this point with um, the values that I got, so zero, pi over four, two pi over four, which is pi over two, three pi over four, and 4 pi over 4, which is pi. So now I'm going to fill in the points. I was at the max, 0, the min, I'm sorry, I should have said 0, I kept saying 0, but when I said 0, I went back to the baseline. In this case, the baseline is 1. So max, 1, min, 1, and then max. So as far as that goes, um, when I was saying 0, I was talking about the, the baseline. In this case, since it was a vertical shift of 1, that baseline is 1. So again, hopefully that helps you graph this. If you can see that um, all together, you kind of look at the way I did that. Um, hopefully you can do graphing uh, pretty easily.